Amen, amen, amen. Good job, band. Anybody see Frank on the drums today? <laughs> oh, Jesus. Ooh, say hi to somebody near you while I try to collect myself. I had a word for someone first service, and um, I have a spoiler alert. I'm going to go long today. <laughs> spoiler alert. If you're, if you're done before I am, the same door that let you in will let you out, right? So <laughs> I had a word for the first, I had a word for someone in the first service, and um, I just feel compelled to share it to you at large. Is that good? Is that okay? Um. We have, this, this church has an anointing of sorts. Like, some, you ever have an anointing you don't actually want? Like, you're a gathering of, like, some people have an anointing to gather weird people. Like, and they're like, why the weird people? Like, like, like I knew a woman um, who had an anointing on her life that, that um, women who had been sexually abused just felt comfortable talking to her. So she would just be like at a party, at a social event, and women would talk to her and then just out of nowhere begin sharing their childhood sexual abuse, which is awesome because she was actually trained in this, but it made most parties awkward, right? It's amazing and good, but you know, gift of people coming to give you money is probably one that's, you know, slightly less awkward, right? <laughs> but, this, but this house has an anointing um, in that we gather, and, and, I, and I really struggled how to say this in a polite way, and I just couldn't. Uh, good people who come from bad churches, right? And we just over and over again gather good people who came from bad churches. And um, it's, it's weird how many bad churches there are out there that can stay in business. Like I feel like as a lead pastor, like I'm like praying in faith every week, you know, like just to, like, it, I don't know. But then there's bad churches that just stay in business. And there's people who have served under ministries that weren't healthy for years. And um, they feel like, um, when they come to a new church, they're starting over, um, and and um, and there's people who like grew up in a controlling religious family that made them do things that they called righteousness, where it's not righteousness if it's not faith. It's just performance, right? If it's not faith, then it's it's not right. But you grew up in a church or in a family that like dictated um, a legalism, right, or dictated, um, you know, and, and what I've seen a lot of is just controlling controlling pastors out of their insecurity try to run other people's lives um, and um, it, it's not helpful uh, and so you can serve under that um, unhealthy um, regime for years and then you get out from under it and you're like you know like well I spent all these years thinking I was following God and I was just following rules or I was just following religion or I was just following uh, man and, uh, and, and I felt like the Lord wanted me to say last service, and I want to share it this service, that you, what you were doing in faith, God received as a holy offering. Amen. Right? That's a good word. Yeah, no, that's, that's good. One clap, we all clap. Come on. That's a good word. And some of you have been manipulated out of money, um, and you did it. If you did it unto righteousness, then it was a righteous offering. Yeah. And it only becomes unrighteous if you regret it. Leave it with Jesus. Like I sowed that in faith, it's with Jesus. And don't take it back and call it something else. And so if you served, uh, like maybe you regret where you had served for a season, you need to just say that was unto the Lord and just move on with your life. Don't regret the hours or years because that was between you and Jesus, even if someone else corrupted it. But they took God's offering and corrupted it. You gave in faith. What they did with it is between them and God. You don't, you don't want to get part of how they corrupted it. So in your heart, stay pure. I gave it to God. It's holy. And God will redeem it. Amen? I am living proof that God will redeem it. Are you with me? Yeah, so if that's you or if that's somebody you know, just receive that and uh, walk with it. And uh, now we're actually going to get in the Word of God. Are you with me? Did I give all the words here? Frank, Mike, Robin, Kellyanne, Elizabeth, Anastasia, Lionel, Calvin. Yeah. Even gave an extra one as I was delaying. I was buying time. I was like, Lord, do I? You don't want to make up a word for your kid. That's, that's not helping anybody, right? A lot of pastors do that with their kids and give them words. Or 
like you're righteous and you want your kids to be righteous, you start telling them they're going to be this, that, and the other when God never said any such thing. If you're not called to be a bishop and you're a bishop, you're going to have a miserable life. If you're an overseer, if you're a pastor, you're not called to do that, you are going to have a miserable life. Don't be prophesying things over your kids that God didn't say. Don't, you're not helping, right? Let them discover who they are in Christ on their own. That, does that make sense? Well, if it doesn't, it will. Okay, in Acts chapter, you know what? Before we get in Acts, do you, do you, don't, you know, um, I, you know, I have for years been, um, for years I have been against the word Easter, right? And so there's debate over the, the, the background of Easter, and uh, Easter bunnies in particular, I was like, okay, maybe eggs mean new life, and Jesus was kind of in an egg like the two. But I just was like, no. Um, and Easter bunnies is really just. And, and, and so I was at a, um, I was at school, and um, Dr. Leonard Sweet told this story about the early church and um, ostrich eggs, which I don't have time to get into right now. But I was like, well, that makes sense, and maybe someone. So I, I don't know. And so there's actually been some research on some um, historical documents on possibly the beginning of the Easter bunny. If you have that, it's possible. <laughs> they think maybe there was a sign. Who knows? Is it possible? Is it possible that that's possibly where the Easter bunny came from? I don't know. I think they're still researching it. And it's inconclusive at this point. It's a mystery, right? It's just a mystery. What's that, honey? We'll just celebrate the resurrection here instead. But Jesus might be giving us hidden messages. We don't know. Um, but we are still in our Stephen message series. And uh, we are finishing up uh, uh, going through Stephen. Um, and uh, we're in Acts chapter 7. We're going to start in verse 46. And we're going to read a chunk of Bible. Tell your neighbor, stay paying attention. I have neighbors laying on the ground. They'll be paying less attention to me, more to Jesus, but they were here for a service. So. Acts chapter 7, 46 says, David, now this is Stephen talking to the Sanhedrin, right? It says, David found favor in God's sight and asked that he might find a dwelling place for the God of Jacob. But it was Solomon who built the house for him. However, the Most High does not dwell in houses made by human hands, as the prophet says, heaven is my throne. Earth is my is footstool of my feet. What kind of house will you build for me, says the Lord? What place is there for my repose? Was it not my hand which made all these things? You men of stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears are always resisting the Holy Ghost. You are doing just as your fathers did. Which one of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? They killed those who had previously announced the coming of the righteous one, whose betrayers and murderers you have now become. He's an encourager, right? Like this is a how to win friends and influence people, right? Acts 7, 53, you who received the law as ordained by angels and yet did not keep it. Leave that one up. That is, that is something. You who received the law as ordained by angels and yet did not keep it. Isn't it easy to look at the Bible and read about Israel and read through the scriptures and read their history and consistently say to yourself, why? Why are you doing that? Don't you know this is not going to work out for you? You know, and time and time again in the, in the Hebrew Bible, we read about how God set them up for success and put them in charge of things. And then people said, well, let's go ahead and visit those foreign gods again. And you're like, why? Why would you do that? Why would you turn again? This is not going to work out well for you. And then someone would be in charge and someone thought, well, maybe I might like to be in charge. And you're like, oh, why? Why would you do that? That would not work out well for you. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Have you read the Bible and you see these, these patterns? And you're like, why do you? And it's so easy as we look back through the lens of history, the mistakes that they made. But I, I, as I read this, I began to wonder, what if somebody, uh, maybe an angel of the Lord followed us around for the last 10, 15, 20 years possibly, and began to jot down that everything the Lord said to us in private, 
every, everything he convicted us of in our heart. And then started writing down everything that we did publicly and privately. And I wonder what the angel would write about us. I wonder what the angel would write about us. And would somewhere in that book it say, you who received the law as ordained by angels and yet did not keep it. How many times in my life, how many times in your life, how many times did God clearly tell us, this is who I've called you to be. This is what I've called you to do. This is what I want you to step out in. This is where I want you to exercise faith. This is where I want you to believe me. This is where I want you to grab hold of my promises. And yet, the next day or the next week or the next month, our life looks nothing like it. And the angel would write, you who receive the law as ordained by angels and yet did not keep it. I wonder how many of us has that happened to? We had an amazing encounter with God and, and, and the heavens opened and the angels appeared and we heard the song of heaven and we said, God, do whatever you want to do in my life. God, I, I give it all to you. I lay all my promises, all my hopes, all my dreams at your feet. I'll be whoever you want me to be. I'll, I'll do whatever you want me to do. Or maybe you were in a crisis. Maybe you had a sick child or you were, you were stuck in a legal situation or maybe something. You said, God, if you will come through for me in this situation, I will serve you for the rest of my life. And in the next chapter would start off, you who receive the law as ordained by angels and yet did not keep it. I don't know. I feel like in, 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 in my story, that would be in there a little more often than I would care to admit, than I would hope to see. But I feel like God is really calling some of us back. And as we look here through the scriptures and Stephen talking to Israel, we, we see very similar things happening because in this time, uh, of Jesus coming, the temple was at its absolute greatest. It was, it was at its height. It was, it was amazing. Everything was beautiful. As a matter of fact, things were so perfect, nothing needed to change. And that's what happens to so many churches in America. Things are so beautiful, nothing needs to change. As a matter of fact, we're getting so spiritual, and we're going so far in God, and we're so deep in God, and we don't know if we're deep or, or high. We're not sure, but we're so amazing. Uh, and 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 we're just it's just so awesome that new people just kind of slow us down a little bit um, and we don't need to reach out to more people because we need to go deeper in what God is speaking to us because we have this amazing prophetic call or this amazing apostolic call or this amazing uh, jurisdictional call or political we have such an amazing call that we just we need to grasp all the amazing things that God is saying about us I mean God is so God's even amazed with us we're so amazing and uh and so we don't we don't bring people along and 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 that's like it's like a family without children and if you don't have kids yet or you haven't had kids this is no condemnation. Uh, but what I am saying is when you have kids, things change. When kids come, you start teaching the basics of life and you start getting reacquainted with the basics of life. And you start saying things you never thought you would have to say, like, no, we only pee in the toilet. <laughs> no, no, this is this is actually where we pee in the toilet. Right. Like, I know that looked like a good idea. It looked like a great idea. It looked like a toilet, but it wasn't a toilet. We cook in that. That's not, that's not what we use that for, right? And these are the things you have to slow down and talk to new believers about, right? Yes, I know you've been saved four days and you think God brought you that man, but actually, it, but, 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 but actually, but actually, no, no, um, not at all. No, what he wants you to do is not an extension of love. It, that's, that has the same letters as love, same number of letters, but it's not actual love, right? Does anybody know what I'm talking about here? Like, actually, if you wait till you get married, it actually will be love, Amen. right? Like, like, God is speaking these things, and we have to remember the basics. And, you know, there's nothing more basic in Christianity than the cross. Amen. And if there's nobody you have to teach the cross to, then you have to wonder how connected to Jesus my church is, yeah. right? Like, we have to teach the cross and and what it is and what we find, you know, in this house, like last service, the kids went crazy. I don't know who was back there making so much noise that, that we had to, oh, it was Sam this time. Oh, uh, Sam, okay. That, you know, we actually had to sit and talk about, like, 
It's like, like here, here's, here it, was so, it was so loud that we had to make a decision that having children is a blessing in this church. Have you ever had to make a decision that children is, are actually a blessing in your family? Have you ever had to purposefully say, no, 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 I'm actually happy. I have them. No, 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 no. I'm actually happy. Devil, you're a liar. I'm actually happy. They're actually a, a blessing. And so we had to make a decision as a church. I had to kind of lead us and say, no, no, no. A church without children is a church that's dying. Right? It's a church that's dying. And, you know, we came up with this fact, uh, you know, that they just, they just crowned a new oldest man, oldest living man in the world. Did you, know, did you see that? They had a new oldest living man. And this, it's kind of like a Supreme Court justice. You get that title for life. You just keep that until you die. And there's churches that live like that. Like we've gotten so spiritual, we can't get young again. We can't get young again. We can't change because we've already perfected it. What we're doing is perfect. Why would we change for young people? Why would we change for new people? What we got is so amazing, they would only slow us down. And all they're doing is racing towards death. That's all that happens, right? Because death is assured. In everything that is like the most precious thing in your life, they're either going to give to somebody else or throw away, right? That's what's going to happen in the end. It's it, right? I mean, that's, that's, that's it. You know, if you watch any of these TV shows where they go through dead people stuff, they're like, no, none of this is valuable. You can throw all this stuff away. And some guy lived his life holding on to this stuff like it was gold, right, until they throw it away. And so we decided we like to throw away the garbage now and stay young. Amen? I want, to, I want to live a youthful life. and I, Come on, amen. Give it up. Yeah, that's good. <clears throat> and so what we see is, you know, Israel was at the height. Like they had, they, they had the, the sacrificial system dialed in. They, 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 they had the temple was amazing. It looked beautiful. And the, the, they, the, the priest system and the offering system. And it was all amazing. Like it was the height of it. It was perfect. It was beautiful. And they thought that all this was a sign because they were so amazing in it that they didn't need anything else. They thought that they were perfect and they couldn't even see Jesus riding into the temple to be the sacrifice because they didn't feel like they needed it. They felt like they got it all together. They thought it, that it was perfect. And, and Stephen was, in, in, this, in Acts chapter 7, Stephen is one by one systematically destroying their self-righteous belief on why they didn't need God to come and do anything. And we've talked about this over the weeks in the first thing. Uh, that Stephen dismantled was their belief that they were blessed because they had the land of Israel. And Stephen said, hey, God actually blessed Abraham over in Mesopotamia. Before you even got into Israel, you were blessed. So how could it be the land that means that you're blessed? And he's trying to say, you're deceived right now. There's a level of deception in your life where you think that you're blessed because of what you have. And so Stephen kind of went in on them. In Acts chapter 7, verse 7, he says, and he quotes God saying, and whatever nation to which they will be in bondage, I myself will judge, talking about Israel. Whoever puts Israel in bondage, I will judge, said God. And after that, they will, look at it says, come out and serve me in this place. And they thought, because we have this place, we're blessed. Because we have this anointing, we're blessed. Because we have this music, we're blessed. Because God has prospered my life, I'm blessed. Because God has given me a great family, I'm blessed. Because we have this land of Israel, I'm blessed. But God said, listen, I'm not bringing you in that land so you can get fat and lazy. I'm bringing you in that land to come and serve me. I'm actually bringing you out of bondage to serve me. Your blessing is your place of service. Your blessing is your place of service. And, I, you know, I love, uh, I remember being single in the Lord um, and I was a little older. Um, my wife and I actually, uh, I was older than her, and, and we were in a church, uh, and, you know, you weren't really anybody if you weren't married, and I found that slightly annoying. Um, anybody single people know what I'm talking about? I uh, found that annoying. And uh, so we've always honored uh, single people. Funny thing, you know, when you're single, uh, a very a present, prevalent prayer is to get married, right? And then you get married, and you're like, ooh, single wasn't so bad, right? But you don't know that until you get married. Once you get married, you're like, oh, single. Oh, how about those days, right? When you're married, you're married. Because when you're single, you think that once you get married, you're going to come into the blessing. 
And then all of a sudden I'll be loved, I'll be fulfilled, I'll be cherished, I'll be nurtured, I'll be, I'll be complete. But really God brings you into that blessing not to be blessed, but to serve your spouse. And if you're in a marriage where you're expecting your spouse to complete you, you're going to have some problems. But if you come into a marriage recognizing my blessing is my place of service, then all of a sudden you get a good marriage. If you have a call of God on your life and you think the call of God is going to make you feel more secure or complete you or make you feel better or people are going to recognize you then or all of a sudden you're going to be a somebody, it's never going to work. If you want to come into your call, recognize that your call, that blessing of your call is a place of service and you may or may not get anything out of it. You may never get a paycheck, you may never get recognition, you may never get fame, you may never feel complete, you may never feel like you're doing anything. You may be sitting with four kids in that back room, taking care of them on a Friday night, thinking this is the great call that you put on my life, and you have no idea that you are carrying the call of God forward to another generation. You are carrying the call of faith to another generation. You think that God doesn't see you sitting in a room? You think God doesn't see you being faithful in your call? You don't think that you don't see God sees you in the in just when you see that person on the street or at a bus stop or just at your job who looks sad and you stretch out a hand of blessing and you actually begin to speak truth and hope and life over them? You don't think God sees that? He sees that. He sees that you're carrying faith forward to the next generation. It's not going to die with me. I didn't get this anointing so I can be blessed. I got this anointing so I can be a blessing to other. God brings us into freedom to serve him and his purposes. Are you hearing me? He brings us into freedom to serve him and his purposes. It's not just because like he's like, oh, look, there's a, oh, look, there's Catherine over there. Man, I think I'll just set her free. Why? Just so you can look, show people how amazing you are. No. Now, God loves you and wants you free, but God sets you free to serve him and his purposes. Now I'm free to be a worshiper of God. Now I'm free to be a servant of God. Now I'm free to be a mouthpiece of God. Now I'm free to be a landing place of God. Now I'm free to be free. Amen? This is why God sets you free. He brings us into freedom to serve him. And so he brought the children of Israel into Israel so that they may serve him there, so that they may be a blessing. Because the promise to Abraham is that the whole world will be blessed through him. And what we see, though, is a religion that doesn't do that. What we see is over the years, that, that, that is no longer a focus. The prophetic word over Abraham is no longer the prophetic focus. Jesus said it this way in Luke 12. He said, from everyone who has been given much, much will be required. And to whom they entrusted much of him, they will ask all the more. Those are the words of Jesus. And so Stephen's here just quoting the words of Jesus to the Sanhedrin. These are non-believers who Stephen is using words that they relate to that resonate with them to preach Christ crucified to them. Do you see this? He's using their scriptures to preach Jesus Christ to them. And so he dismantles that you're blessed because you have a land. And then, um, you know, he, he continues to go on. Because when we encounter freedom, hear me. When we encounter freedom, when we encounter God, when we have the encounter with his anointing, when, when, when we have... When, we, when the heavens open and the angel comes and the presence lands on you and, you and you see him, those times when you want to lay down your life for him, when we encounter his freedom, we have access in that moment to an unlimited amount of grace and mercy. We have an access to, and this is why we need to get in the presence as often as we can. That's why we need to get into worship quickly. That's why we need to show up early, get ready to worship enter into worship because the heavens open in here and God's angels are ministering and his spirit is here and Jesus is looking upon this place and the love of the father is being shown here and you want to encounter God in those moments so you because you have access to unlimited amounts of grace and mercy when you have access to God you hear what I'm telling you and God is expecting us to extend the mercy we've received to those who are far from his mercy this is what he wants. He expects us to extend that mercy. He's like, I'm going to open heavens. I'm going to fill you up so you can start giving my mercy away. That, that, that's why he brings you into freedom. That's why he brings you into freedom. And so, so Stephen dismantles this. You, you came into freedom so that you could just have a plot of land. And then, they, they, you know, we talked about this last week. They said they were blessed because they have Moses in the law. You remember we talked about this last week, and he's like, y'all never did serve Moses, right? Even from the beginning. But, but here's kind of what he's coming after. 
<clears throat> we have this habit, and we don't like it, but we have this habit of we are us and they are them. We are us and they are them. It's always our group, our clan of people, and we want to stay away from them. What's funny is no matter where you are or where you go, there's always an us and there's always a them. And you can live here and be us and you can move there and be a them. You're like, what are you talking about? I used to be an us, right? And now I'm a them, right? You were somebody in elementary school, you get to middle school and all of a sudden you're a them. <laughs> then you were somebody in middle school, you go to high school and all of a sudden you're no longer an us like you were in eighth grade. In ninth grade, you're a them. And all of a sudden, it's funny how we could just separate the us and the them. And we tend to think that us are the ones that God loves. And them are the ones that need to change. We are the righteous. They are the unrighteous. We are doing things correctly. They need God to come and rebuke them. Right? Are, you're, you're hearing me. That's, that, that, that's, that's what we do. And Jesus kind of went after this in Luke chapter 10. And this dude says to, says to Jesus, he says, you know, what do I need to do to be right? What, what do I need to do? And, and, and this guy thinks he's going to set Jesus up, which is hilarious, right? Like it's, have you ever tried to manipulate Jesus into anything? Well, God, how am I supposed to do this? If I'm gonna do the, God's like, yeah, okay, yeah. Oh, you're twisting my arm here. I have no idea what I'm going to do. Doesn't work out well. Does anybody know what I'm saying? doesn't work out well. And so, so Jesus says, to the, guy, he's the, guy says, the guy says, well, what do I need to do? And Jesus, brilliant, he says, well, what's in the law? Now, I don't know if you know this, the law is big. There's a lot going on in the law. But Jesus knew what was going on in his heart. This guy is trying to justify himself. So Jesus says, well, what's written in the law? Luke 10, 27, the guy says, well, I know what's in the law. I got this. Because what we do is when we look to justify ourselves, we quote the things that we think justifies us. We come up with a law that we can pass, and we tell God, I'm doing that. Why aren't you blessing me? And God's like, I didn't actually tell you to do that. So I know you, but, you know, if you're going to justify yourself, you have to bless yourself. Oh, come on. <laughs> That's a good word right there. And uh, the guy answered Jesus, and I want to be blessed by Jesus personally. So I want to know what qualifies me. So the guy says to Jesus, you shall love the Lord your God. He said, what's in the law? You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, with all your strength, all your mind, and... And your neighbor as yourself, verse 28. And uh, Jesus says to him, you've answered correctly. Do this and you will live. Now, guys, like, oh, wait, wait, whoa, 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 what? Wait a minute, wait a minute. What? I missed something. Like, I, you just, I think you just set a trap for me. What, what, what happened just now? What? So, the guy says, so the guy says, verse 29, but wishing to justify himself, he says to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Basically saying to Jesus, and who's us? Right? Trying to trap Jesus. Who's the us I'm supposed to love? Who, who am I supposed to identify? Who's the neighbor? Right? He said he used neighbor, but what he's saying is, come on, Jesus, let me know. Who's us? Right? And Jesus says, oh, okay, um, who's us? Uh, let me tell you a little story. He's like, he's like, there was this guy one time. One, one, as a matter of fact, he was one of us. And he was walking down a road. And he got beat down, and he got robbed, and he got left by the side of the road. And one of us, our priests, you know, the guy running the temple, he saw the guy, and he's like, ah, that guy might be contaminated. I, I don't want to touch him. And so he walks by him, and he leaves him there. Then another one of us walked by the guy and saw him. You know, this is one of the guys who takes care of the temple. He, he runs the church, and he was in charge of all the religious ceremonies. He knew all the ceremonies and that was his job. And he saw the guy and he didn't help him either. He just, he just walked by. And then one of the other people, not even one of our people, not even one of us, he saw the guy and he stopped and he took care of him and he carried him and brought him to a clinic. And then he paid the medical bill for the guy. And he said, hey, listen, take care of this guy for me. And when I come back to town, I'll pay the rest of his medical bill. And, 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 and the question Jesus then asks is like, you know, who in this do you think is really one of us? Them? He says in Luke 10, 37, he says to the one, he says, 
Next verse. Luke 10, 37, he says, and he said to him, the one who showed mercy toward him. Now, I need you to see how radical this is. All of a sudden, us went from people who owned the land and had the promise of Abraham to the ones who show mercy. Jesus completely shifted us right there. He says, the one who showed mercy toward him. But the guy's thinking, but that's not one of us. And then he said, go and be like that guy. Now, I don't know who the them is in your life. I don't know who them is. Because we all have an us and a them. And if we don't let Holy Spirit come into our hearts, we'll think that Jesus agrees with us. If we don't let Holy Spirit come and convict us, we'll think that whoever we hate politically, whoever we hate socially, whoever we hate economically is them, and Jesus is agreeing with us that it's them, not us. And Jesus is saying, what's mercy look like? But that's not righteous. No, no, I'm asking for mercy. What does mercy look like? Now, I don't know who them is to you. I, 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 don't, I don't know if them are, are the neckbeards carrying a Confederate flag with a MAGA hat. I don't know if them is a Black Lives Matter shouter burning down a building, kneeling for the anthem. I don't know who them is to you. But Jesus said, anytime they show mercy, you better identify with them. You have to identify with them. He's like, I know that you have a group who has agreed to ignore Jesus and hate someone. But you don't get to do that. You don't get to agree on Facebook that them are evil and we are good. You don't get to be them be they, uh, uh, supporters of a different uh, a sports team, a supporter of a different political candidate, a supporter of a different country. If you're hating them, Jesus is on their side of the wall. That's, um, it's just the gospel. Are you hearing me? It's just the gospel. There's nobody in the book you can find we're allowed to hate. We hate the devil. We love people. Yeah. Are they a people? Then they're not people that someone that God hates. Does this make sense at all? Yeah. Here's what I want you to know. You can check off all the religious boxes and still fall short of God's best. You could be the priest who walked by. You could be the guy who runs the temple walking by. Check off all the religious boxes. If you're not showing mercy, you're falling short of God's best. Are, are you hearing me? This is, what, this is what he's trying to tell him. You can fall short of God's best. He's like, who is the one that you're supposed to be with? The one who acted in mercy. This, this, it, just, it just changed everything. And I'm here to let you know today, it doesn't matter what family you're from. It doesn't matter if you come from a great family or a terrible family. Maybe you're like me and you don't have a spiritual lineage. Maybe you don't have a spiritual heritage. Maybe you didn't get taught the Bible as a child. Maybe your parents were hypocrites. Maybe they said they loved Jesus, but you just found religion. Maybe, 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 maybe you struggled with sin your whole life. Maybe you inherited nothing from your family but sin. Maybe you inherited nothing from your family but bondage. Maybe they still haven't spoken an encouraging word to you. I'm, I'm, I'm here to let you know today that Jesus Christ is welcoming you into a new reality, to a new us, to a new blessing, to a new lineage, to a new family, to a new inheritance, to a new future, to a new righteousness, to a new hope. This is what God is doing in your life. And all you have to do is associate yourself with the God of us. Because no matter where, where you're at, there, there, there's the cliques and clans. I mean, they, they, everywhere on the planet you go, there's cliques and clans. And, and they, they separate themselves among the weirdest ways. And in America, you know, we, we like to do it ethnically for whatever reason. This is what we specialize that in that in America. If we do anything great in America, we separate ethnically, right? Like we, can we talk about that in church? Are we allowed to be a multicultural church that talks about multiculturalism? Can we talk about that a little bit? Is that okay or is that taboo in the church these days to talk about people? Now, my wife and I, we came up from like possibly a slightly different generation. You know, I grew up in Delray and, uh, and, I, and I, I've talked about this before. You know, we're, we're celebrating our 10-year anniversary and the year that we started um, our church, that same year is the year that the Little League in Delray Beach became um, desegregated. It was only 10 years ago. They had, they had an American League and there was a Little League uh, or the National League, National League and American League in Delray Beach, and one was black and one was white. And, and it, was, it was radical 10 years ago that they integrated it on purpose. Crazy, right? Like, that's just, and so when we got engaged, you know, we're a multicultural 
family, and uh, we thought everybody was looking at us. It was pretty funny. Now, like, everybody, like, like it's no big deal. I'm like, that's because of us, right? You're thanking me <laughs> that nobody's staring at you. You ain't special. <clears throat> but people, like, 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 so we went on a cruise. Was it last summer we went on a cruise? Last summer, and we went, like, to, it was nice. Like, if you feel like, man, Lord, what, what do I get the Thomases? Cruise? Like, um, <clears throat> I joke, kind of. Um, so we went through um, the Caribbean. Like, we'd done, like, the, 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 the Bahamas, Mexico thing. Like, you can only go to Cozumel so many times. Like, at some point, you're like, all right. The last time we went there, we rode a broke-down Jeep, praying in tongues the whole time, trying to get around the island before it broke down, and... We were abandoned, so my daughter, she was scarred. We can't go back to Cozumel now. And so we, um, we went to um, St. Where did we go? Cayman, Cayman Islands. Islands in Jamaica, all right? And so Cayman Islands was not great. But Jamaica, Jamaica's n- known for something, right? Not just the bobsled team. Anybody know what I'm talking about? And so um, we're, we're, and we're, we're in Jamaica. We had an amazing time in Jamaica. I jumped off cliffs. I do all the stuff that I like to do, right? I'm jumping off things. We're, we're uh, uh, in um, the ship. There's no big dock there uh, at Jamaica uh, where we were at. And so, like, they had to, like, dock out a little bit. And you take these little tenders back and forth, these little boats. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Back and forth to it. And so um, there was this. Uh, we, we, we take carnival. We like it because it's just middle class people, just working class folk. Like, people had to pay for it, right? And, um, and, uh, and like, you know, I'm just saying, you know, we, we went on a nicer one before and they were boring because people were like, this is what we do, whatever. And other people were like, hey, I'm on a cruise. We're like, that's my people right there, right? <laughs> like, that's, 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 my, that's my people, <laughs> right? And so, um, and so there's a lot of words in the summer and, um, and it's in the summer and, uh, and, and there was like a lot of work. You know, there was a lot of family reunions and you go, you guys know the only people have family reunions, right? Black folk, right? That's the only people that have family reunions, right? I don't know why, but th- that's the only reason. And, and, and what I came up with is white people are like, I moved away for a reason, right? <laughs> but, but black folk are like, Look, come on, let's all get together and eat some barbecue and not talk that much. I don't understand. I go to my wife's family reunion, I don't get it. But, but family reunion. And so there's a bunch of big family reunions on the cruise. And then there's like a bunch of like, well, can, can, oh, can we just, all right. So just regular old black folk. And then there's like a bunch of, I don't want to say neckbeards, but just country folk, we'll say. Like, Arkansas, just country folk, right? right. And so the generation I come from, there could be drama. Like, where I came, like now, now you might say the racial problems are bigger than ever. No, at least we're talking about racial things now. When I grew up, we just fought, right? That's all there was. It was fistfights and riots, right? Now there's actual political action and people protesting, and that's actually healthier. Things are getting healthier. There's dialogue. That's good. It's not healthy dialogue, but there's dialogue, and that's better, right? Right. Eventually, it'll be healthy dialogue, and things will get good, right? Like, you fight, and then you calm down, and you have a conversation. Like, oh, I didn't realize that's what you're saying, right? Is that every marriage fight ever? Yeah? <laughs> right? And, and, so, and so, you know, that's where we're at racially right now. And so, um, we're on the tender going, coming back from Jamaica, and like, Half, we'll say half, half the boat is family reunion <laughs> dudes, right? Family reunion dudes. And the other half, I feel like we're going to do a square dance hillbilly throwdown at any moment, right? Like that just, if I'm offending anybody in here, I hope I'm offending everybody, right? I just want to, whatever you identify with, right? And so my wife and I are sitting here and um, we're very aware of these kind of dynamics. And I'm like wondering, how's this going to go down, right? Like what's, How's this going to go down? Like, nobody's, like, talking yet, and we're just sitting there, and I'm like, oh, boy, right? And so this dude from Arkansas, he's, like, he's like sitting. Like, th- it was full, so the dude from Arkansas sat next to family reunion dude, right? And so they're just sitting there, and the Arkansas dude says, well, I knew that security wasn't going to find my weed, right? And I'm like, wait, is that the way? Wait, wait, what? And then family reunion dude says, me too, brother. And now they're, they're, they're talking about how they're both smuggling weed from Jamaica <laughs> onto the boat. Now, all of a sudden, people all around are talking about the weed in Jamaica. <laughs> and where there was like this racial division, all of a sudden, there's a clan being formed around smuggling drugs into the United States of America. And I'm like, my kids are here. <laughs> And folks are like, that's why you don't take carnival. That's, that's, <laughs> 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 so, 
see, like, you know, you know, we're just like, okay, okay, this is it. And I'm just like, watch, I'm like, this is, this is like, this is a sociologist, like, study right here. Like, man, look at, these people are gathered, there's community being formed. Like, no matter where you go, there could be an us and a them, right? Like, no matter what you do in life, there could be an us and a them. And when you start looking at them all, there's somebody else's us, right? And we just need to like look at a little bit more grace and stop saying God's wall is separating us from them. Instead, it's just how we're looking at things. Does that make sense, right? Amen. Yeah, yeah, no, that's good. And so, 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 so Stephen dismantles that this us and them based on the law and, and, and Moses. And then he goes after the temple, which was beautiful at that time. And um, he's like, you know, David wanted to find a home for God. Now, I need you to think. Now, it's easy since we've read the Bible to be too familiar with it. I want you to think about God. How do you build a house for him? I want, okay, let's think about it another way. Think of the Milky Way. Think of the moon. How do you build a house for the moon? Think about this. How do you build a house for the moon? How do you build a house for the stars? How do you build a house for a galaxy? How do you build a house for God? How deceived were they into thinking that they could build a house and then God should move in, right? God is so merciful that he would like visit one room of it, right? He's like, okay, I'm just, you're just so cute what you're doing here. I'll play tea with you, right? There's no actual tea in the cup, but I'll sit here at the table with you and play. This is how awesome God is. I am the God who spoke everything into existence, and you put some rocks on top of each other, and you called it my house. Isn't that cute? Does this make sense? We, We want to say that we own the house of God, right? We own, like we're in charge, like we're running. But I need you to hear that we're at our greatest when we're extending a hand of mercy, when we're helping the hurting, when we're sharing our story of encountering God, this is how we're at our best. Let me say it again. We're at our greatest when we're extending a hand of mercy, helping the hurting, and sharing our story of encountering God. But instead, they want to build this temple that God could live in so that God could be inside their walls, right? And so in in, in Acts 7, 49, Stephen kind of quotes God. He's like, God's like, uh, um, heaven is my throne, and your planet, uh, I use it as a footstool for my feet. What kind of house are you going to build for me? What kind of house do you think you can build for me? What? What? See, here, 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 here's why this is crazy. God has to build his own house. Hear me. He's that big. He has to build his own house. And you are the home God always wanted to live in. God builds his own house. And you are the home he always wanted to live in. He, he didn't want to live in a, in a, in a, in a, in a brick thing. He, he, th- th- this is the message that Jesus came. This, this is the message. Look, I'm not looking for you to cut your back, and I'm not looking for you to be miserable, and I'm not looking for these sacrifice. He says this in Matthew 9, 13. Go and learn what this means. I desire compassion and not sacrifice. And I really feel like some of you need to, to make that like the verse for this season. Me, I am going to go and learn what this means. I desire compassion and not sacrifice. I did not come to call the righteous, but the sinners. And, and what the church does is, the church says, look how righteous I am behaving, God. Why don't you now come to us, the saints? And God's like, I'm not really looking for your sacrifice. I'm looking for you to have compassion because I came for sinners. I'm looking for you to have compassion on sinners. So that's why I actually came. Go and learn what this means. Quit building a temple. Quit claiming your land. Quit claiming that you have the prophets in Moses. Go and learn. I'm actually looking for you to be compassionate to, watch this, them. I'm looking for you to be compassionate to them. It's easy to be compassionate to us. I'm looking for you to be compassionate to them. Jesus is calling sinners home to be with his Father. And you are the calling card. You are the invitation card to his house. 
Now, we may give you cards to use. We may give you graphics as tools. We may train you with the Go team on what words to use. But you are the actual calling card for people to know that God is calling them home. Go and learn what this means. I desire compassion and not sacrifice. God desires a relationship with you that actually flows through you. That's what he's looking for. Not that it all stops in you, but it flows through you to them. I, um, I got radically saved. I, you've heard my testimony many times, I think. I got radically saved in my late 20s, and um, uh, the gifts came very quickly to me. And uh, I very quickly began to operate in you know, prophecy and word of knowledge, word of wisdom, evangelized a lot, saw a lot of healings, a lot of miracles, a lot of deliverance. And uh, uh, just saw amazing things. And since I was a little older and since I'm, I'm very stubborn, I was able to live uh, pretty righteously. And uh, I had driven most sin out of my life. And, and I was seeing miracles. And, and I had a crew of people. And, and uh, very quickly after that, I uh, helped plant a church. And I was on top of the world, man. I was God's man. I was God's man of power for the hour, as they say. And I thought I was, thought I was doing great. And um, <clears throat> what, what, what had not actually, uh, what, what had not happened yet was I hadn't encountered God's love. And then one day, uh, I was at a service in, uh, in Cutler, Cutler Ridge, and I got touched by God's love. And I got touched so powerfully and so radically, and I can't explain exactly how this happened. I got touched so radically and so powerfully, it literally felt like something was being cut off of my heart, and I got radically, radically sick. And I don't know why this happens, but more than one occasion, I had an encounter with God's power and illness would break out in my life. I don't understand why exactly that happened. But this time, I got super sick. At the end of the service, I was outside. I was vomiting uncontrollably, which I just was hoping was deliverance, uh, which, just to be honest with you. Uh, but I got super sick. I was, in a, I, was, I was in bed at home three, four days, something like that. I had a high fever. My throat was covered in welts. And uh, I had not taken aspirin or visited a doctor since I got saved because now I am a child of God. I don't need that anymore, right? Like, that's where I was at. I didn't take it. I didn't take anything. I was like, I was telling people, you're like, how are you going, how are you going to raise the dead when you can't even cast out a headache, right? Like, like you can't deal with a headache, but you're going, to, you're going to cast out polio. Come on, man, right? So I was just like, I'll deal with it. Jesus will heal me. But I was in bed for days. And then finally, I got so sick, I had to actually go to a doctor, right? I had to humble myself and go to a doctor. And what happened as this love began to work through my life is my judgment slowly but surely was being dealt with. My self-righteousness was being challenged by God. And I had to humble myself and actually receive help from other people. And at first, it was a doctor. And I'm not saying that God got me sick. But I am saying that I got very sick. And God used that to humble me enough to need some help. And um, as time went on, whoever my musician is, if you'll come up, please. Uh, And as time went on, um, God began to do this work in my heart that love began radically dealing with my judgment. And I was his judge for so long that he didn't need to be on the seat of judgment. Um, uh, and, and I learned a doctrine that I embraced and I taught. Like, if there's something wrong in your life, it's your fault. If there's anything wrong in your life, it's your fault. And since I operate in the word of knowledge, in the word of wisdom, in the word of judgment, uh, which isn't actually a gift from God, uh, I could point out to you why it's your fault that you're having problems. I could see people sin, and everybody's dealing with sin. I could see sin, and I could tell people, I see this problem, I see your sin, then clear it's because of that sin. And, um, and that was wicked. And when I, got touched, um, when I got touched by God's love, when I had that encounter with God's love, this love began to burn in me so brightly that it took a while um, to my shame, but I began to see people through the love that he saw me through. Does that make sense? It wasn't that I learned how to be humble, it was that I... I would see people the way God saw them, and I would see, like, that's not my heart towards them. And I knew something needed to change, and it wasn't God. It was me. And once I saw how God loved people, I had to tell my story. Once I saw how God loved people, I had to tell them my story of being separated from God And how he loved me in the midst of my chaos and welcomed me into the family. That somebody, you know, reached out a hand to me 
and invited me into the family of God when I was them. When I was the one who would make fun of Christians. When I was the guy who would mock Christians. When I was the one who saw the board game believers and I would call them hypocrites and I would make fun of them and I would even tempt them in sin and I would do all these. I was them. I was, I, if, if God had a them, I was them. And yet God called me an us. And I had to tell people my story. And so during the following months and years, I learned how to be an extension of his love. Now, it took humility, and it took me not needing to be the center of attention, but God being the center of attention. Because that's really who deserves to be the center of attention. And so I'm not saying all this to um, drum up a church service, um, but I look at empty seats, and every empty seat I see a life that doesn't know God loves them. Every place I see a person could be sitting, I'm like, that's an encounter that God wants to have with his child who's not here. That's a lost one. That's a prodigal of my father who sent his son to die on a cross, and yet they're not here receiving what Jesus paid for with his life. And it's just easier on Easter than it is normally to invite people to church. And we hope that we're not trying to grow church when people encounter Jesus. And we found that if you can get people connected to a local church, they can grow in their faith. Here's what I want you to do this week. I want you to find someone who needs God's love and just be present. Stop and be present. Don't be their solution. Don't be their judge. Be present. Like someone, when I was them, was present enough to tell me their story. I was far from God. And I remember the girl who used to witness to me in college. And she told me her story so many times, I, I knew it, and I would make fun of it as she was telling it, when she would tell it to me again. She said she was at a, a night of worship at uh, Universal Studios or Disney, one of the when they used to have the, the worship nights. Everybody remember that? And she said, I remember one time I was just there with a the youth group, wasn't even saved, and it was a full moon. And, and she said, the worship leader was standing there. And he said, see that moon up there? I don't know about you, but my God made that moon. She says, and I don't know what happened, but at that moment, I felt love come over my entire body. She told me that story so many times. I made fun of it every single time, but now I tell it and I cry. That's not a Bible verse. That's the story of an encounter. And your encounter still has encounter on it. And when you tell your story of encounter, you share the encounter with them. That your encounter can become their encounter. When you're present with someone else, God will be present with you. So this week, I want you to just, I want you to determine in your heart, I'm sharing the encounter. You don't have to preach the Bible. You don't have to tell them what they're doing wrong. I want you to share your story. Stand with me. Let's pray. Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I just pray right now. We thank you so much for our salvation. I thank you so much that you sent your son to die on a cross. If there's anything good in us, it's because you put it in us. And we don't justify ourselves in any way, shape, or form. If we're justified at all, it's because you sent your son, Jesus Christ, who was born of a virgin, who never sinned and was beaten and scourged and, and nailed to a cross. And on the third day after his death, he rose again from the dead and he went up into heaven. And one day he's coming back. That's our justification. Listen, if you're away from God today, if you're not right with God, it, 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 it's stupid to leave here without getting right. We got a little TV right over here because the fire department made us put a little one where there was a big one. There'll be someone right under there. If you need to meet Jesus, there'll be standing, someone standing right underneath that, that, that TV. They love to introduce you to the encounter with God. And so, Father, I pray in the name of Jesus. I pray for every man, woman, and child under the sound of my voice that they wouldn't be okay with them, that the people that they call us don't know Jesus, that don't know where to find salvation, who don't know where to find hope, who don't know where to find life, who don't know where to find the way. So I pray in the name of Jesus that we'll look with fresh eyes in our workplaces, in our classrooms, in our, in our neighborhoods, and where we go to hang out and Father, I pray in the name of Jesus that we will be carriers of your anointing this week. In Jesus' name. And everybody said?
Amen and amen. Yeah, give a clap out for the Lord. Come on, give it up for the word this morning. Thank you, Pastor Carl. That was amazing. That was amazing. This week, guys, I, I want to echo Pastor Carl's challenge to you to find someone who needs God's love and to be present with them. You know, next Sunday's Easter service. And as you go out this week to fulfill that challenge, we've given you some tools. First and foremost, we've got invitation cards for Easter service. We've got invitation cards. And when you leave here today, you're going to grab a stack of these cards off the table in the lobby. And as you go out this week, and as you look for someone who needs the love of God in their life, you're going to give them a card. And you're going to say, hey, come to church with me. I'll pick you up. I'll grab you a cup of coffee. If you just want to meet me there, it starts at, at 9 and 11. You got choices. People like choices, right? And you can let them know you got some choices. But come to church with me. I want to invite you to come encounter this God that I have encountered. And the second tool we have for you is right here. It's this graphic. And if you go to our website, revivallife.church, Forward. Yeah, there we go. That, that, that's what I want. If you go to our website, revivalife.church, you're going to see this right there. And you're going to click that button that says enter website. And when you click the button that says enter website, you're going to see at the top it says Easter invites. And when you click Easter invites, it's going to go to this page. And you can download two graphics for social media. And you're going to download those graphics. And you're going to put them on, on your social media. You're going to put them on Facebook and Instagram and Twitter and whatnot. And you're going to invite everybody you know to church this Sunday. Because the world needs an encounter with his love. Amen. Give it up one more time for what God did today.